going to begin with hymn number 57 in the hymn book, please. Hymn number 57, page 199. My heart and voice I raise to spread Messiah's praise. Messiah's praise, let all repeat the universal Lord. We'll stand as we sing a familiar tune to you all, I hope. Hymn number 57, let's sing with all our hearts.
Amen. Now let's come before the Lord in a word of prayer together, please. Every head bowed, every eye closed in the Master's presence. Eternal God and loving Heavenly Father, we do thank Thee today for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank Thee that He is King of kings and Lord of lords. And we read and sing, even in that beautiful hymn, so many wonderful references to Christ as the conquering and victorious one. Father, we thank Thee for what we have sung, that He will be triumphant o'er His foes. Father, we live in days of darkness. We live in days when it seems like the devil is having a field day. The day when there feels like there are so many foes of Christ. But we praise Thee that He is and will be and always will be triumphant o'er all His foes. We thank Thee that He will throw their empires down. We thank Thee that the great Messiah reigns. And, O oh, Father, as we approach Thy throne, we thank Thee all the more as Thy people that we are on the victory side, that we are going to live and reign with Christ. And, Father, we realize that we do not deserve this wondrous and splendid position we realize we do not deserve to be the adopted sons of God, but we thank Thee and praise Thee for the blood of Christ. We thank Thee and praise Thee for Christ, our great high priest, that offered himself and offered a wonderful sacrifice for sins forever. We thank Thee that the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, God's Son, cleanseth us from all sin, all our sins, every single one of them. We realize, Lord, that we are truly a privileged people in this worship service today. And we thank Thee for each one that is saved and knows they're saved and can look back to a day and hour when they repented of their sin, trusting Christ as their own and personal Savior. We thank Thee for those that are Thy children. We thank Thee for those that are new creatures in Christ. And Father, we do make special reference and prayer today for those in our midst that know they're not saved, and maybe they're good people. In fact, we know they're good people. They're, they're good people. They're good church attenders, Lord. We, we love them, and we just pray that, be, that, that they would be saved today, that they would put off this matter no more, that they would do business with God, and realize that Christ is altogether lovely, that He is a wonderful Savior, that there is none else like the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, Father, we realize that after salvation, there's not a single soul that has ever said that I wish I wasn't saved. Lord, we thank Thee that Christ is not a disappointment, but He is all in all to us that are saved. And Father, we ask that those souls that are yet without Christ, that they would realize they must come. They must come God's way, not their own way, but God's way. They must repent and believe the gospel. And, oh, Father, send thy spirit to convict them of their sin today. Send thy spirit to open up their hearts to the truth of the gospel. Send thy spirit to open blinded eyes. Send thy spirit to save them by sovereign grace and make them new creatures in the Savior. Oh, Father, send thy spirit to move in our midst today. We ask that each one of us may leave rejoicing, rejoicing that we have met with God, rejoicing that God has come down, rejoicing that something for eternity and of eternal value has been done. And, oh, Father, we do pray that we may rejoice because we have done business with God today. Oh, Father, Thou knowest so often, so often we just... We just come and we go through the motions, Lord. We just do what we always do for the sake of doing it. Lord, save us from that. It's no better than popery. Lord, forgive us for it. And we pray that everything we say and do today, that, that we will do it with meaning, that we will do it with praise, that we will do it in spirit and in truth, whether it's the singing of these beautiful hymns. Help us, help us to sing with all our hearts and, and singing to the glory of God. Oh, Father, help us as we pray. Help us to really pray. Lord, Thou knowest so often we can be, we can be dead and apathetic and, and we can be silent when we should be praying. Lord, help us to pray today. 
Lord, help us in the reading of thy word. Help us to realize that we are reading the very words of God. And Father, help us especially in the preaching of thy truth. Burn it upon our souls. Oh, Father, we pray that thou would stop us from just hearing the word, thinking, wasn't that an all right message? Going out the door and forgetting all about it before we get out the car park gate. Lord, forgive us for it. Lord, we pray that we may be not only hearers of the word, but doers of the word. We pray that we will be thinking about the word every single day, every single hour, every moment, until the next time we're confronted by thy word. And allow us then to be continually meditating upon that word. And Lord, we pray that the word of God may rest within our hearts and our souls, and that we will be those that are continually continually thinking upon the truth of the gospel. Oh, Father, we pray, help us to do all things in this service to thine honor and to thy glory. And save us from our Protestant form of popery. Save us from ritualism. Save us from apathy. Save us from just doing what we always do. And help us today to worship thee aright. Lord, we pray for those that can't be with us today. Thou knowest there are many. And we would love to see them here again. There are many that are laid aside and shut in at this time. And they would love to be at the house of God. They love to be here. And they're praying for us even now. We know that. But Father, we pray be unto them all that they need. And Lord, we pray for those that, that should be here and they're not here. And thou knowest the reason for that as well. Convict them of that matter. And bring them out to the house of God and help them to have that resolve that I should be here. Lord, we pray for thy people today. And Lord, we pray that thou be pleased to move amongst us, that this would be a Sabbath day like no other Sabbath day, because it's a day when God came down. It's a day when God visited Money Slain Free Presbyterian Church. It's a day we'll never forget, because our souls burned within us. So Father, bless us now. Help us as we continue in the worship of thy holy name. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hymn number 59, please. Hymn number 59, same page, 199. Jesus, the very thought of thee, with sweetness fills my breast, but sweeter far, thy face to see, and in thy presence rest. Another beautiful hymn, beautiful words, and let's sing to the glory of God, hymn number 59.
Now we're turning in the Word of God together, please, to the book of Philippians, the book of Philippians in the New Testament, and we're reading chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, and we're going to read the first 11 verses together, please. We're looking at the title, The Returning King, The Returning King. It ought to thrill our souls, friend, that the Lord Jesus Christ is not in the tomb today. We serve a risen Savior. We serve a Savior that's alive right now in the glory, and we serve a Savior that is coming again. He's returning one day, and he's returning not as a babe, but he's returning as a king, and as the king of kings and lord of lords. So we're looking at this title, The Returning King. We'll read the first 11 verses of Philippians 2. In a moment, we're going to consider verses uh, 9 through to 11 primarily, but Philippians 2 verse 1, the word of God states, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We trust the Lord to bless the public reading of his holy and precious word to each of our hearts. Now at this point in the service, let me Bid each one a very warm welcome in the Saviour's name. It's lovely to see you all. I trust the Lord will bless us as we gather around the Scriptures of Truth today. Please remember the Gospel service tonight at 7 p.m. That will be preceded by a time of prayer at 6.30. And please do come and please bring someone else with you as well as we endeavour to plead with souls concerning their need of Christ. But then for the week ahead, the, on Tuesday, the Gospel Boss Meeting for the boys and girls at 7 p.m. We've been greatly encouraged at that, and we trust if you know boys and girls that are not yet coming, that you would invite them Tuesday, 7 p.m. in the church hall. Then on Wednesday, the prayer meeting and Bible study at 8 p.m., uh, and Mr. Jonathan Eccles will be along to preach the word. I'll be away doing a deputation meeting for the Education Board, so please do remember that. Please plan on attending let me say it was good to see so many of our own people out on Wednesday evening uh, past, and it was a wonderful meeting, but please don't make it a one-off. Make it every week and come back, and I know it will be a blessing to your soul to be in the place of prayer and around the Word of God. Then on Friday, the Youth Fellowship at 8 p.m. We're at home this week, and Jonathan Story will be along to look at the subject, How to Read Your Bible how to read your Bible. But then the services next Lord's Day, the Sabbath school and Bible class at 10.45 in the morning. Let me emphasize those. If you know of any that are not yet coming to Sabbath school, please do bring them along or invite them along in the Bible class. That's open to everyone. I was going to say from as soon as you finish Sabbath school to age 100, but maybe there's someone that's over 100, I don't know, but uh, or maybe you feel over 100, but everyone's welcome to the Bible class as well, 10.45, morning worship, 12 noon, preceded by prayer at 11.30, then the evening gospel service at 7 p.m., preceded by prayer at 6.30, and we look forward to next Sunday evening, the Reverend John Wagner is over from the United States, and we have the opportunity to hear him preach next Sunday evening, and we look forward to that, and I trust you'll plan on attending a wonderful preacher in the gospel and I trust you'll be in your place for that meeting especially. Then today, the Whitfield College Covenant Offering. 
So please remember that as you leave. And then just another reminder, as I've said for the last two weeks, that the hall will be closing as an overflow from the first Sunday in November, and the annex will be closed as an overflow from the first Sunday in December, and the cry room will be available at the back of the church if any uh, don't feel comfortable coming into the main church building as yet. But let me remind the elders, our next session meeting is due for Monday the 24th of October at 8 p.m., Therefore, any items for the agenda need to be submitted to Mr. Sturt, the clerk of session, before Saturday, please. I'd also appreciate your prayers for Wednesday morning. Have another opportunity to go into the Bronte Primary School, and we look forward to that. A wonderful opportunity in the gospel. So please do remember that in prayer, God's people. And then please remember that our Dara are having a gospel mission in Ruth Island High School. And the Reverend William McRae will be taking that mission from Monday the 24th of October through to Friday the 28th of October, just five nights. And I trust if you can attend when there's nothing else on in the service uh, in Monish Lane here, that you'll be able to support our sister congregation in Ardara. But please pray for those that are sick, those that are shut in. There are so many that need our prayers in these days. It can be easy to forget about them at times. But let's remember them before the throne of grace and prayer and those that have been bereaved of late. But of course, all of these announcements are subject to the will and mind of the Lord. But we're going to sing together again, hymn number 60, hymn number 60, page number 200. Jesus, thou joy of loving hearts, thou fount of life, thou light of men, from the best bliss that earth imparts, we turn unfilled. To thee again. Truly we need the infilling of the Spirit of God and we trust that the Lord will come down in answer to this prayer of hymn 60. Let's stand as we sing, singing with all our hearts. It's good singing and singing of beautiful truths. You know, at times we can miss out certain hymns and only go to familiar hymns. And I think they're hymns that we haven't sung before in my time in Monish Lane, and I trust it was a blessing to your heart.
We're turning in the Word of God to Philippians chapter 2 again, please. Philippians chapter 2. And let's read from the verse 6 through to the verse 11 again. Looking at the title, The Returning King, and we're going to be looking at Christ's humiliation and exaltation and then Christ's return. But Philippians 2 verse 6, the Word of God states, Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. With our Bibles open before God, let's seek the Lord's face in a word of prayer together, please. Let us all pray. Heavenly Father, we still ourselves in thy presence now. And we thank thee for what we have read. Even if we are just finishing there and reading that portion together, knowing that the King is returning, it ought to thrill our souls. And Father, we do pray, bless the preaching of thy truth now. Help us, we plead of thee. Help us to, to make much of Christ. And we pray that we may see that he is altogether lovely and that some soul yet without Christ would realize that they need to come and find him and repent and believe the gospel. We pray that they would taste and see that the Lord is good. But bless us now. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Sometimes it's very easy to look at all of the discouragements in the world. I don't know if you find that. Maybe it's just me and nobody else. But I find sometimes it's very easy just to look at all of the discouragements in the world. And if we're honest, we, we feel like giving up. We feel like throwing in the towel feel like surrendering, feel like just grieving constantly and continually. Because literally in every aspect of life, we find something to grieve our hearts. Even when you consider the very earliest and most precious times of life, that, that, that moment when a, a child is conceived and grows in its mother's womb and what is meant to be the safest and most precious and a, a, a wonderful time of a child's development, that miracle of a child developing over those nine months in a mother's womb, even in that stage of life, we find something that the world is able to grieve us over. They call it abortion. Christians ought to call it murder because that's exactly what it is. Murder of babies in the womb in what is meant to be the safest place for a child. And yet anyone that is born today is essentially a survivor of a murderous intent from many that should be and have made an oath to save and preserve life. Even when you think of, of children at the tenderest of years, there is so much to lead them astray. As only saying on Friday night at the Youth Council uh, night of prayer in morn as I was preaching, a saying that especially teenagers and, uh, and people of that age, especially in high school age, that they have so much now to lead them astray. So many temptations, so many vices, so many things that older ones, we, we just don't have a clue about. I'm only 28. I've only left school 12 years now. But there are things in schools now and there are things with internet, social media, mobile phones, all the rest of it. There are greater temptations now, even at the tenderest of ages, to lead young souls into wickedness and into the devil's grasp. Even in life in general, we see so much to grieve our hearts, so much, so much wickedness, so much immorality, 
You know, I, I don't know if I've said from the pulpit before, but I got through uh, a magazine from someone. I get various Christian magazines and organizations and all the rest. I'm sure many of you do. And one of them, concerning King Charles coming to the throne, had written out on the back of the magazine the entire words of the national anthem, but had put a little asterisk and changed the words of the second verse and changed it from, may he defend our laws to, may he defend right laws. Because there are so many laws that we don't want the king to defend today. There's so many laws that legislate for, for wickedness, like sodomy and, and uh, uh, any other form of, of immorality. And, uh, and there's so much that grieves our heart. Even if we look at church life, there's so much apathy, isn't there? So much compromise, so much apostasy. There is so much godlessness that can grieve our hearts. And I'm just going to be honest with you today. There is so much in this world to get you down. Whatever aspect of life you're looking at, whether you're looking at family life or church life or work life or political life, or not even get onto that, so much to grieve our hearts. However, I want to tell you this, my friend. And you say, why have I started in such a negative vein? I tell you these things to help you to remember that no matter how dark the days are, no matter how discouraging the world may be, no matter how, how fierce the devil's attacks may seemingly be, I want to tell you this, and this is the thrust of the message, that our King still reigns. And that's something to shout hallelujah about. That our King still reigns. And our King, the Lord Jesus Christ, is still on the throne. You see, we don't belong to this world. Friend, if you're grieved by this world, if you're discouraged by that, this world, take it as a good sign, because it means you're not of this world. You don't think like this world. You don't want to get involved with the vices of this world. You don't want to participate with the things this world participates in. You don't want to talk like the world or act like the world or walk like the world. You praise God for it because you belong to a different kingdom. You belong to a different king. We are citizens of a greater kingdom, namely the kingdom of heaven. We are subjects of a greater king than even that of Charles. And we are the subjects of a conquering king, the king of kings and lord of lords. Come with me to John's gospel, please, and turn with me to John chapter 15 and the verse 19. I want you to see certain things about Christ as our king and this world and the kingdom of heaven. And I trust that it will thrill your soul, friend. Because you remember this. The world hated our Lord. The world hated our king. And if it hated our king, then it will hate the king's subjects as well. And take heart from it, friend. It means if the world despises you, then you are the child of God. It says in John 15, and look at the verses 18 and 19. It says, If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. And then look at the verse 19 of John 15. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Turn with me over the page to John chapter 18. John chapter 18, and look at the verse 36 with me, please. And it's wonderful, because the Lord Jesus clarifies it further. You see, Pilate asks him about this issue, asks him about his kingdom, asks him about him as a monarch. And look what Jesus says in John 18, verse 36. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. So where is the Lord's kingdom from? Well, let's turn to Revelation, Revelation chapter 6. And friend, I want you to see these things, and I want it to encourage your heart because it encouraged my heart this week as I was thinking about these truths. And we find, yes, we are not of this world, and the Lord is not of this world, and we belong to another king, and we belong to another kingdom. And where, what do we find here in Revelation 6 and the verse 2? Look at it, please. We read of Christ, we read of the king, 
And it, we read that our king is, is a victorious king as well. It says in Revelation 6 verse 2, And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him. You see, this is an image, a picture of Christ, our king, one with a crown. And it says, And he went forth conquering, and to conquer. You see, there are so many in the apostasy and in the liberal, uh, the liberal religious scene today that would paint Christ as this lovey, dovey, namby, pandy, soft Jesus. Friend, our Savior is a king. And our Savior is a warrior king. And he's conquering the hearts of his people, quickening them out of their dead condition. He is a warrior king that is putting all of his enemies under his footstool. He is a warrior king that is going to subdue the world one day. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. What else do we find? Come with me to Revelation 19. Over a few more pages. Revelation 19. And we find the name of Christ that is given. And you know these portions thrill my soul. They really do. And there's so much we read here. We read in Revelation 19 and the verse 11. Look at it with me. It says, verse 11 and following, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. You see the same character now that is in Revelation 6, the same character wearing the crown, the same character conquering uh, and going forth victoriously. It says in Revelation 19, verse 11, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. That's only Christ, by the way. There's only one that is faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. There's only one that is the righteous judge. Verse 12, his eyes are as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. You see, same image now. He's a king, and it says in the verse 12, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. You say, how do you know it's Christ? Because Christ is our sacrifice, as our great high priest, as the sacrificial lamb, as the one that shed his blood. There we find it, a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called. Are you ready for it? Just like John writes in John 1, he writes here in Revelation 19, he is called the Word of God. Verse 14, and the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. Everyone look this way a moment. I want to stop there. You know, friend, you see when you get discouraged, you know when you're getting down, and you know when you think the devil's having a field day? And you know when you think that evil and wickedness and immorality and apostasy are, are, are gaining the field? I want to tell you this, Christ is coming again and he's going to smite the nations. He's going to deal with them. Look at the verse 15 again. Look what it says. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Don't you look forward to that day when Christ will reign in righteousness? It says, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. He will deal with his enemies. And look at the verse 16. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. I want to tell you this, friend, and I encourage you in this. And the whole purpose of this message is to encourage, friend, the king is returning. The king is coming again. No matter the wickedness that may go on, praise God, the king is on his way. And we ought to pray for that. Come with me to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, we're told to pray for that, you know. We're, to, we're told to pray for the Lord's return. We're, we're to pray that the Lord would hasten the day. We're to pray with this in view and in mind. And the Lord, when he teaches his disciples to pray in this model prayer or this pattern prayer, we find in Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6, look at the verse 10 initially with me, please, in Matthew chapter 6. He tells them how to pray. He says one of the first petitions. Now, the first verse of the prayer, verse 9, is about worshiping our Father which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. And the first petition that is there, verse 10, thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. The return of Christ is in view there. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Look at the verse 33. 
of Matthew 6. We find the same thing. What are we to do as God's people? But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Do you know what I fear? Come back with me to Philippians 2. Do you know what I fear, friend? What I think is a very real problem in the church of Jesus Christ today? I fear we're not putting the kingdom of God first. I fear we're not looking for the return of Christ. I fear that actually it doesn't really bother us if the king is returning or not. I fear that we think that the devil owns the show, the devil is going to carry on being victorious, and we forget that our king still reigns. I want you to be encouraged in this, that we are to have in view our king and his kingdom, and thy kingdom come. Now, as we come back to Philippians chapter 2, I want to break up this portion, and I want to look at Christ's humiliation, Christ's exaltation, and then thirdly, Christ's return. So look with me, number one, at Christ's humiliation. Now, we were looking at this in the Bible class, and the word humiliation, we're simply referring to the fact of Christ's time upon the earth. The time when Christ humbled himself. The time when Christ humiliated himself. That's what he did. He humiliated himself to come in human flesh. You think of who he is. He's, he's the creator of all things. He's the son of God. He's the one that the angels were singing his praises. He's the one that all the saints revolve their, their glory and their praise and their adoration around. And we find this Christ, the second person of the Trinity, the one who spoke all things into existence. He came down to this earth, took on human flesh, became a babe in a manger in Bethlehem. And the one that spoke all things into existence humiliated and humbled himself so that he couldn't speak at all, so that he couldn't walk, so that he couldn't care for himself, so that he needed Mary as a mother to, to be tender as a mother is to her child. He humiliated himself in his time upon the earth. And that's what we read in Ephesians 2. Look at the verses 6, 7, and 8. It says, Who, being in the form of God, He is God, He is divine. And there are some, JWs, Mormons, others, they profess to be Christian. I tell you this, if they deny that Christ is God, they are not Christian. They're not saved. This is fundamental stuff. Jesus Christ is God. And it says in the verse 6, Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, because he is God. And it wasn't robbery to call himself equal with God, because he is God. But look at the verse 7. But made himself of no reputation. No reputation at all. I tell you this, if anyone had a reputation, it was Jesus Christ. You know, all of us like to safeguard our reputation you don't like it when someone bad mouths you. You don't like it when someone says something behind your back. You don't like it if someone doesn't like you. You don't like it if someone thinks ill of you. If anyone had a reputation, it was Christ. And in his humiliation, the word of God tells us that he made himself, no one else did it to him, he made himself of no reputation. And he took upon him the form of a servant. He's the high king of heaven. And yet he lowers himself to the lowest of the low, and he becomes the greatest of servants. Isn't that amazing? What Christ has done. And then what else do we read in the verse 7? And was made in the likeness of men. He took on human flesh. Look what else we find in the verse 8. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. Come with me, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3, we read all about this. Paul writes to Timothy and talks about what he talks to the Philippians about. We find John writes about it. We find a whole host of others write about it, how Jesus Christ as God became man and he humbled himself. And it ought to thrill our souls that the king of kings humiliated himself so that he could identify with us. It really is remarkable. And we read in 1 Timothy 3 in the verse 16. And without controversy. So this is a truth where Paul is saying to Timothy, this is something we don't argue about. 
This is a fundamental of the faith. If you're arguing about this, then those people who are arguing against it aren't saved. This is without controversy. Great is the mystery of godliness. That word mystery refers to something we didn't know, but now God has revealed it to us in his word. It was a mystery, but now we know. And look what it says. God was manifest in the flesh. God, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, became man. God is manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. You see, friend, this is Christ. This is our Savior. He humbled himself. He made himself of no reputation. He was found as a servant and found in fashion as a man. But you say, to what end? Come with me to Philippians 2 again. Philippians 2 verse 8, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. You see, we can't look at the returning king without looking at the king the first time round. And why did he come? Why did he do this? Why did he humble himself? Why did he humiliate himself? Why did the king take on the likeness of one of his subjects? So that he could purchase you. So that he could die for you. So that he could shed his blood for you. He became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And let me say this. If there's somebody here and you're not saved, and you know you're not saved, and you know maybe that you need to be saved, I tell you this today, friend, there is no one like Christ. There is no one like the Savior. The Lord Jesus left heaven's glory and came to this wicked world of ours. You think of the humiliation in all of that. And to what end? So that he could die for you. Greater love hath no man than this. That a man lay down his life for his friends. Romans 5 verse 8. But God commendeth his love toward us. Why? In that while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. And friend, if you're not saved, I, I trust that you'll heed the word of God and you'll realize that it is time to seek the Lord. The Bible in no place ever tells you to wait till tomorrow to get saved. It tells you to do it now, to get right with God now, to do it while there's time. And I tell you this, friend, when we look at this, th this ought to thrill our souls about what the king did the first time round. Christ's humiliation. But then I want you to note, secondly, Christ's exaltation. His exaltation. Look at Philippians 2 and the verse 9. Because we read more now. And it's wonderful. It says, Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given, an, uh, given him a name which is above every name. You see, friend, he is the one that humbled himself, verse 8 tells us. He is the one that humiliated himself. He is the one that, verse 8 says, became obedient unto death. And we find on the back of that, because of all that Christ did, because of all that Christ accomplished, we read in the verse 9, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him because of his finished work. Now he is exalted. Now he is King of kings and Lord of lords. And friend, I want you to note this. Look at the end of the verse 8. It, became, it says, And became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Full stop. But that's not the end. Christ is no longer in the tomb. Christ is not a dead Savior. I do not recommend a corpse to you today. I recommend a Savior that is alive. I recommend to you one that is in the glory right now. And the verse 9 can only be stated because he rose from the dead. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. You know, you think about this, friend. It's no big deal to hear of, of somebody dying. We hear of death all the time. Sure, our newspapers have a whole segment called the death column. We're used with death. We don't like it. We're grieved by it. We shed many a tear, but we're not, we're not surprised at death. If I was to tell you, and I've said it before, but I'll say it again. Listen, listen, I got, I got something for you. Listen, Queen Victoria's dead, you know. <laughs> you go, oh, man's a bit late on the news, isn't he? Queen Victoria's dead. She's been dead over 119 years, I think. She's been dead. 
And you say, what? There's no news there. If I just say, hang on, listen, listen. Oliver Cromwell's dead, you know. <laughs> you say, well, you're a few hundred years late for that. But you know, the truth is this. If I was going to tell you Queen Victoria is alive today, or Oliver Cromwell was alive today, you say, hang on. Now that's news worth talking about. That's something worth hearing. Well, I tell you this, friend. Jesus Christ, he died and he was obedient unto death. But I tell you this, he's alive today. And that's the good news, that he is an exalted Savior. He is one alive and he lives in the power of an endless life. And our Savior will never die again. Our Savior will never die again. And because He lives in eternity and will live for eternity, you and I, our souls, those of us that are saved, will also live for all eternity. And it's wonderful. It really is wonderful. Come with me to Revelation chapter 1, if you would. Revelation chapter 1. We read of this, that He is a highly exalted Savior. And we find it here. We read in Revelation 1 and look at the verse 7. We're going to be revisiting these verses later on, I think. But we find in Revelation 1, look at the verse 7 initially, we find that he, he, he is coming again. It says, Revelation 1 verse 7, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I tell you this, he can't return if, if he didn't rise, if he wasn't exalted. You see, friend, our Savior lives today. Look what we read in Revelation 1 and the verse 18. It's the text above my head in the pulpit, but it says, I am, alive, I am he that, that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of death, of hell, and of death. You see, friend, we serve a Savior that is alive, and it's wonderful. And that's what we're reading now in Philippians. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name. And I want you to be encouraged in that, friend, that what we're reading in Philippians chapter 2, what we're reading here is that our Savior is alive, the one that died, he's rose again, and now he's highly exalted. He's highly exalted. And even after he lived that humbled and humiliated life, even though he lived that life that you and I could never live, he lived a sin-free life as the impeccable one. And he died an atoning death upon the tree. I tell you this, my friend, even though he went into the tomb, today he's alive. And he's highly exalted. And he has a name above every name. And I tell you this, every knee will bow before him one day and we ought to look forward to that day. But then with that in view, we find Christ's humiliation in the passage. We find Christ's exaltation. But then I want you to note thirdly, Christ's return. And that's what we read here in the verses 10 and 11. Oh, friend, this thrills my heart. I trust it will thrill your heart. Philippians 2, verses 10 and 11, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of things in heaven. You think of that, whether it's the angels, whether it's the saints that have gone before us. Things in heaven and things in earth. Isn't it a wonderful truth that every single individual will bow the knee, every single one that is in earth and things under the earth. It's amazing that even those in hell, even those that, that think that they could carry on in their sin without Christ, every single living being is in subjection to Christ. And it says in the verse 11, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You know, friend, this is our chiefest consolation. And this is where we go full circle in the message, friend, because we serve a returning king. There is so much to grieve us. There is so much to get us down. There is so much to cause you anxiety. There is so much to cause you tears. There is so much to cause you that, that grief of soul that only the believer can know. But I want to tell you this, our chiefest consolation is that we have a returning king. 
And I tell you this, friend, doesn't matter if it's the evolutionist. Think of the evolutionist. You know, there's an old secular proverb that says, if you're going to tell a lie, tell a big one. <laughs> well, I tell you, evolution's a big lie. And there's many a school, many a university, many an intellectual and a scholar that has swallowed it hook, line, and sinker. The lie of the devil. But I tell you this, every evolutionist that has tried to defy God, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Every humanist that has tried to dismiss the knowledge of God and the law of God written on their hearts, they will be proved as the fools the psalmist tells them they are that day. As every knee will bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I tell you this, the climate change fanatics, those that will be on your television and those that will peddle fear and nonsense and fanaticism and anarchism, essentially, that's what they're doing. And friend, I tell you this, you driving a diesel engine or a pickup truck or a tractor or anything else, I tell you this, friend, their lies will be proven and one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess to the God that told us in Genesis that there will always be the four seasons to the very end of the days. And I tell you this, friend, the sodomite lobby too. Oh, friend, they can have their day and their hour now. They can have their parades. They can, they can propagate their filth in the schools. They can do their utmost to try and pollute the minds of men and women. But I tell you this, they have their hour and they have their day. But there is coming a day, a greater day, a wonderful day, when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. You think of those those wicked individuals that see fit to murder the child in the womb, those that are meant to be saving life, those that are meant to be preserving life, those that would advocate for abortion. And you know, you see so many, so many women in political power today, you really wouldn't think that something like the murder of a child would be an issue with so many women in powers and spheres of influence. But still, I tell you this, one day, every knee will bow, every Every tongue will confess. There's so much to get you down, friend, but there's so much that will bow the knee, whether it's the liquor tycoons with all the money they make of destroying homes and destroying families, whether it's drug dealers, whether it's anyone else that propagates that which would make you unwell. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. Whether it's false religionists with Islam and Hinduism and Sikhism and any other ism under the sun, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. Friend, whether it's the compromises, there's so many, so many today that think they can take away brick after brick after brick of God's standards and God's separation principles and they think they can compromise and they think they'll be okay. I tell you this, every single compromising knee will bow the knee to Christ and will confess Him as Lord of all, whether it's the apostasy, the unsaved ministers. I tell you this, friend, it grieves my heart. It grieves my heart to see so many filling pews and listening from pulpits, uh, listening to pulpits that have nothing to tell their souls, nothing to tell them, no Christ, no salvation, no nothing. I tell you this, every single one of them will bow the knee to Christ and every tongue will confess, whether it's politicians, whether it's anyone else that you can think of, friend, every single one will bow the knee and I tell you this, they can have their day today. But there is coming a day when Christ will break through the clouds and he'll come again as the returning king. So friend, take heart. Christian, take heart. They may have their day today, but tomorrow the king is coming. And we read that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I don't know about you, but it thrills my soul to think I'm not of this world. It thrills my soul to think I serve a different king. It thrills my soul to think that my king is coming again. And I ask, does it thrill yours? You know, friend, 
Stop looking around. Stop looking around. You know, the scriptures tell us, you see when, when the days are getting darker? You see when things are getting rougher? You see when things are getting more evil? The word of God at no point tells you to bury your head in the sand. Never tells you to do that. It says, look up. Why? For your salvation draweth nigh. And the more you see it, the more wickedness you see, the more evil you listen to, whatever it is, whether it's evolution or false religionists or, 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 or the liquor trade or, or, or politicians or apostasy, whatever it is, friend, look up. Look up, for your salvation draweth nigh. And I tell you this, the king is on his way. The king is on his way. So friend, rejoice. The next time you see Michelle waxing eloquent, and you say, boys, oh, our country's in a state, you remember this, she'll bow the knee before the king one day. The next time you hear Liz waxing eloquent about what this budget's going to do and that budget and all the rest of it. You tell her this, one day a king is coming and he's going to smite the nations and he's going to rule them all with a rod of iron. You rejoice in it. Rejoice that the king is returning. Take heart, friend. The king is on his way. But I ask this as I close. Are you ready for that day? Maybe there's someone here and maybe you're well aware that the king is on his way. I don't know when the king is coming. The king may come tomorrow. The king may come in 25 years' time. I don't know. may come in 200 years' time. But I know the king is coming. But friend, are you ready for the king coming? Are you ready? Because you see, when the king returns, he'll do one thing when he comes. He'll separate. You separate what he terms as the sheep from the goats. And he'll separate the saved from the unsaved. And he'll take the saved unto him, uh, himself, and the unsaved will be cast out into a lost eternity in hell. And I tell you this, friend, when the king returns, it's too late to get right with the king at that point. It's too late to trust him then. It's too late to repent and believe the gospel that day. Friend, I plead with you, be ready, ready, ready for the king. Because the king is coming. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of of God the Father. Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed, please. Let's still ourselves in these closing moments. Believer, has your heart been weary of late? Has your soul been grieved by all that you see going on? Take heart today. The king is coming. But sinner friend, you're not ready for that day. And right now I want to ask, will you prepare for that great day? Right now you can pray and ask the Lord to save you. Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever, that's you, that's me, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Friend, don't put it off for another time. Don't put it off for another meeting, another week. Be saved today. Trust him today. Because a day will come when time is over and the king has come and judgment will be faced. The king is returning. Heavenly Father, bless thy word to every heart Save souls, we plead. Encourage thy people. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.